dear ones. You're listening to the What God Is Not podcast with Father Michael O'Loughlin and Mother Natalia. Hey friends, this is Mother Natalia. Today's episode is Father Michael's, but we have a very delightful guest, Brother Simeon Miriam of the CFRs, um, who he and I go way back to about 16 hours ago. And uh, we go through a little bit of his background in what it's like to be a Byzantine CFR and some of the ministry that he's been a part of in um, kind of entering into his Byzantine faith while also ministering as a CFR. And we talk about the concept of Pustinia, the Pustinia that Brother Simeon is beginning after we finish this recording. Um, There's lots of laughter, a little bit of awkwardness, and mostly just pure delight. So if you are a hashtag banter hater, you're going to want to skip ahead, um, like our guest, Brother Simeon. Uh, you'll want to skip ahead to timestamp 930 or something like that. I'm not very good at this. <laughs> Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Mother doesn't laugh at me at all anymore, except when there's silence. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh more at silence than you laugh at my jokes. I don't know how to quite how to take that. Maybe that's um, <laughs> maybe that's the monastic in me. <laughs> uh, I'm like so that. come to delight. I like that. Yeah, no, I don't think that's it. Were you laughing at my bad grammar during the prayer? I don't know what I was laughing at. I think I'm just nervous. I don't. Was it really bad grammar? I don't know. I call I called y'all I, I called y'all hearers instead of listeners. That's not horrible. <laughs> it's not. It's just we're, weird. We're talking of we're talking about core wounds and <laughs> one, one of my core wounds is that um even from like early on in the priesthood, people have like I've been interviewed by, you know, newspapers and things like that. And when I read back, because they always just like they they're good journalists, so they'll put exactly exactly what I said. <laughs> I'm like, please don't do that. Please just edit edit what I, you know what I meant to say and put that in the interview. One time I got interviewed by the local news station because Conan O'Brien had said something on his show the night before about there's a new app. You can go to confession on the app. So the news station decides to make this a story on the evening news. And so they call the Archdiocese of Denver and I knew the communications director. So she had them come talk to me. And it was actually really beautiful because she comes in and she's like, she's filming me and she says, so um, can you go to confession over an app? And so I had to look it up and it was just the confession app basically that gives you. <laughs> you didn't have to look up whether or not you <laughs> I, I, go to confession I, I, over I, an correct. app. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. Speaking of, 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 I, I make my living giving talks um, <laughs> and preaching, um, and I'm horrible at this. Um, so I, I had to look up the uh, the app to see what it was. I was like, okay, it's just, it guides you through the Roman confession. It, it gives you an examination of conscience. It has a little place in notes where you can write down your sins and things like that, then erase them It's basically all. like those apps then where you can like make your grocery list on the app. Exactly. Yeah, okay. and it, but it kind of guides you. It'd be like that. Sin, so it's a little different. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, listeners, this is not true. The app does not absolve you. <laughs> I didn't quite catch that, so I'm glad you clarified that. So our listeners are like, like, um, Byzantines are weird. Um, so, uh, so yes, the that's not wrong. So I had to look up the app, and I had to explain it. So, but then this this woman at the end, so she she does the whole video, and then she says, um, "Can I ask you a question?" and I said, yes. And we sat down for like an hour and a half. Literally, her videographer just left. And she just stayed there, like must have been going to call him when she was done. But she was asking about like annulments and the rosary had to get back in the church. It was it was so beautiful. Mm. I just thought, you know, we had a very beautiful church too. So I, again, it's a testament to beauty. But she came in. I think there was just something about the church that, that she said, I, why not? I have a captive audience here with this priest that... I know she probably said, can you give us an hour and a half? And it took like 15 minutes, you know, thank God. Um, but anyway, yeah, that, that, that was, I watched that back again. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I am so ineloquent. The, the words coming out of my mouth and the order they, they come out in. So it's for the glory of God that you guys get anything from me at all. I know our poor media team, whenever they pull out a quote for the week, um, <laughs> it's always a struggle to find one that's actually, yeah, <laughs> they're so good. Cohesive and yeah. Yeah. 
You know, I, I actually have an icon of Moses. I asked for an icon of Moses, but I didn't even know existed for my ordination. And I, because I had just read that passage and I said, he was so, and I, I always got irritated by him because I was like, Moses, just get on with it. Like you, you, you weren't given that gift, but just stop being, just stop doing what I just did. You know, <laughs> just like I, 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 I do self criticisms because I think it's funny, you know. Um, but, but there's, but I was like, I, but when I see other people, I get irritated because I'm like, you, you're, you're serious right now, right? That, that you, you can't do these things. Um, anyway, I, one thing, another thing I found, and we've talked about this before, one thing I found is that, um, when you have, like, this podcast is has been absurdly successful in its re- outreach, and the number of people that that the spirit works through 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 our conversations, which is amazing. Um, <laughs> and I, 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 I mean that like really like divine, divine, amazing because brother, t- brother <laughs> Simeon just said, "I wish you hadn't told me that." <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's it, we we say if something is actually fulfilling a need within the kingdom of God, I would rather, if, if it's being successful according to the kingdom of God, I would rather show immense weakness. Mm-hmm. Like why, it's, it's like St. Paul, right? Who says, I'm, I'm ineloquent because I want Christ to show forth. I'm an earthen vessel. Um, and I, I, I think that there, if, if something's gonna be successful, why not manifest in, in those who are doing the work an immense weakness because then the success is just that's measurable. It's success, but then what's what's not measurable, and it also gives people hope in in their themselves, also in their weakness. <laughs> They're like, if these two can be Christians, <laughs> yeah, 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 right? But, or, or even or even like my old podcast, it was for priests, mm-hmm. and I can't tell you how many men just <laughs> said, you know, I love the way you guys love each other. I mm-hmm. love the conversation you have. I I love. Basically, how how you you say things that probably should have been edited out. Um, you know, you you're, you're totally awkward sometimes. Maybe I could be a priest too. You know, because <laughs> I do I do all those things, and those things I thought would have been impediments to this ministry and this vocation. You know, we're not. Mm-hmm. So, and it's the same thing for a nun. I mean, it, it really is. It's it's been helpful in that way. So yeah, I I don't I don't mind. Our my, listeners say my awkwardness is endearing. It, That's yeah. what they say. And I, uh, I, I've, I've never, you, I've never thought you as awkward as, as um, I've seen it. I've seen it a few times. I've, I've, I've actually, because for a while, I never considered you awkward at all, at all. But I'm, and I'm, then you were like, and then oh, I was like, oh, there I it is, it. there it is. Okay, it, it came out in a moment. <laughs> but it's a beautiful, endearing awkwardness for sure. But it's funny because I, I'm that way with. I, I think I'm a typical man in that way where I'm just unobservant. Mm-hmm. Like I had to when I was in college, I had to tell. I had to tell, people had to tell me that a girl was attracted to me. I was like one of those guys, which I thought that's silly. Like every guy is just looking for any girl to be attracted to him. Like that's what you do in college, right? You're obsessed with <laughs> with flirtation and women being attracted to you. So how do you miss that? You know, how do you miss that? But it, I missed it a few times. Um, but there were there was a few times people have said, um, oh yeah, that, that guy's really awkward. And I go, really? And then I'm like, I pay attention. I'm like, oh my gosh, he's incredibly awkward. Like, not, <laughs> not just a little bit. Like, I'll share it with you afterwards after we got there. Who I'm talking about? There's two men specifically who I'm thinking of. Um, but yeah, it was so. Anyway, it's like, why There'll not? Be Father Michael's parent attention today. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'll say I have two men in mind. <laughs> That's really funny. I should do that. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to be. There's a uh, woman named Bill who. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to throw you off the scent here. All right, well let's uh, let's introduce our guest that you you've heard from. Um, we need to buy more mics, Great. Mother I Natalia. Know. We need we need a third mic. I know. Here. I'll get a third mic. Um, I also am very sorry to poor brother Simeon because um, I get really nervous whenever I'm recording a podcast or giving a talk or anything like that. Like heart rate's in the fat burning zone. Palms are super sweaty, <laughs> and you have to share this mic with me. <laughs> So I'm just going to hand you the very sweaty mic, and I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> okay, I'll go get my gloves. <laughs> yeah. Let's wrap it in paper towels. Um, <laughs> the um, uh, that, that rustling sound you heard was Mother Check at the time of the end of the banter. <laughs> I just realized she didn't hear that because I'm the only one wearing headphones. <laughs> sorry about that. I didn't. Uh, speaking of our awkwardness. <laughs> I, 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 I looked at my watch when we started. 
But then I totally forgot what the time was. Thank you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I we will need to cross that out and change it now. <laughs> That's true. Because that was banter we just did. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we welcome a very special guest who um, I, I've, I've, I've only met you once, brother, and you seem to be very good at, at our style of podcasting, and I, and I appreciate that immensely. <laughs> you seem very normal um, and helpful to the send, or aw- just awkward you enough. Seem awkward. Just awkward enough, I should <laughs> yeah. say, I guess, for this podcast. So, um, so we have a brother Simeon Miriam, who is a CFR, which stands for Community of Friars of the Renewal, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I I, I got you seem in, a little unsure. Well, I got in trouble one time. I'll, I'll I'll say this: I got in trouble one time, and I don't want to bring up any d- drama. But um, I got in trouble one time because I called them the Capuchin Friars of the Renewal. <laughs> See the look on his face. Yeah. <laughs> and and I got I got a, a ten minute lecture from this Capuchin <laughs> that I was talking to. Um, so anyway, I that, I that, I think it's officially Community Friars of the Renewal. Um, and uh, we having brother on because he was a, a request uh, to be a special guest by uh, Deacon John the Dean, who is one of our advisors, who's on our staff, who was able to go to one of the events that I imagine you are kind of your best in. Would you say that about your your Pustinia evenings? Or no, is this is this something you're horrible at and you just do it because the glory of God will shine through <laughs> your, your earthen vessel? <laughs> Uh, if I think the way that I've experienced it is the inventing or ideating of the of the events mm-hmm. is where I ah uh, feel most alive, and then the actual doing of it is where God's power is made perfect wow. in weakness. You and I are exact opposites. <laughs> uh-huh. It's it's so true. Like I I am not a planner uh-huh. at all. Like I'm a dreamer. I can ideate things. But I need some to take those ideas and put them into a structured order, and then and then lay out the entire plan, mm-hmm. and then just tell me go. And then one of my favorite things to do, I remember being a kid and saying, "I want to be a a radio talk show host because I lo- I love the I love the you just you have what you what you're handed and then make the best of it. Yeah, uh, that's why I love. So anyway, I don't want to make it about me. Um, so yeah, so so basically. Um, I met you, brother Simeon Miriam, at the Metropolitan Assembly that we hosted in uh, our Byzantine church hosted in New Jersey. And uh, somebody had, you can give the background if it's interesting, if not, <laughs> don't, don't do it. Um, <laughs> but somebody had invited you and Father Tom, Father Tom Schubeck, Father Tom Schubeck um, to come. Oh, he invited you, Father Tom invited you. Yes. Or okay. Do you have another Inv- CFR? Inv- Inv- told me. I think uh, think no, no, oh. not that event. Not that um, event. So, so you came out, and if you can please give us your, since we are a Byzantine Catholic podcast, give us your your Byzantine background and how how you ended up doing Byzantine things that we're going to get to in a moment. Yeah. So, my growing up, I was raised in the faith in the Latin rite. Uh, baptism, formation, sacraments, all according to the Latin, right? My mother is Latin um, and very devout. My father is Ruthenian Byzantine. Um, but as he was getting older, growing up, and then started dating my mom, they started to practice the faith together according to the Latin, right? And that was where they raised all, all three of us, myself and my brother and my sister. Um, so I knew that at some point I learned that technically or canonically, I belong still to the yeah. Ruthenian Byzantine church. Um, but I didn't understand it, and I was like, the only times we would go as a kids were like holidays or anniversaries. And so, just like, why does this take so long? <laughs> why can't I see anything? Uh, <laughs> let's leave now. So, that was growing up. Um, I went off to college, and then when I went to college, walked away from the Lord, chose the party life for a while, and then he drew me back. Um, in the midst of that return, I just knew, again, it was like, I think it was my guardian angel just reminding me, okay, yeah, technically or canonically, like I'm, I'm Byzantine. I wonder if there's like a place or a home for me there now that there's a real love and fire for Christ that I didn't have before. Mm. And so in the midst of like wondering that, two things happened was I found the Byzantine parish in Philadelphia where I was studying and then also came across just providentially a prayer rope and the Jesus prayer for the first time. And so 
the Lord gave a grace uh, that I think, like in a word at the time, I didn't understand it, but of obedience to just like, I encountered the the way of a pilgrim, the Jesus prayer tradition, the philokalia. And I just had this like grace to know, okay, these, these fathers, these monks, I'm just going to do what it tells me to do. Like, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to be holy, but they seem to. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just going to do what it says to do. And so just the Lord just threw me into the, into that spiritual life, into the spiritual tradition. And at the same time, uh, just found a Byzantine parish, the divine liturgy. And so from the return to the faith in college, uh, up until the time I joined the friars, I was mostly practicing the, the Byzantine rite. And so that was where I learned and grew in, uh, yeah, our liturgy and that, and the Eastern tradition joined the friars. And then now, obviously the liturgical life of the community is Roman. There's a, but there's a beautiful latitude in, in our way of life as far as like personal prayer, spirituality to, to continue in the tradition of the fathers, the Jesus prayer. And then the Lord has given back, yeah, through the Pustinia evenings and just through connection to some of the, some of the clergy and some of the young adults out in the New York, New Jersey area, just like a reconnection to the Byzantine roots. It's been a beautiful experience to kind of like breathe with both lungs in a new way. Um, because as I joined the community, continue to discern my vocation with the friars. Um, there's a real experience in my heart of like living as an exile because something just started to make sense, like experiencing a, a home when I'm in a Byzantine church with the Byzantine community um, and asking the Lord, like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Like not just living here and, and living here. And the Lord just kind of highlighted for me, Abraham, um, the exile mm-hmm. through whom we have faith and the promise and just the invitation to live uh, in, a, in a real way, like that exile spiritually, liturgically, interiorly, but that through that, the Lord's promise is that he would bring life. Uh, and so that's more than the question that you asked about my roots, but yeah. No, that's great. It's, it's, like, uh, it's like Walter Chizik's writing two books, Right, he wrote the one that was the story, and then he wrote the one that was the the spiritual background of the yeah. story, of course. Um, so I wanted just to, to explain to our listeners. So he mentioned he's canonically Byzantine. That's because you are the you belong to the ritual church of your father. It doesn't matter even which church you're baptized in, as you said, Brother Simeon. You you were baptized Roman Catholic, but you're still technically Byzantine Catholic because you belong to the right of your father, no matter what you're baptized. It's so I made an invalid novitiate actually. Wow, I didn't. I didn't know that in time. Yeah. Uh, and then toward the end of my novitiate, the light bulb went on and I was talking to a brother <laughs> and he just mentioned Eastern churches. And I was like, mm. hey, am I going to have to do something about that? And he's like, what? I was like, well, yeah, like my dad's Byzantine. And he's like, yeah, you should probably call like our canon lawyer yesterday. And so <laughs> this was May. I was scheduled to profess vows in July. And so in, that, in the meantime, I was like, okay, like write a letter to Bishop Kurt. Mm-hmm. Send that letter to Rome. Pray that everything comes back in time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so in the midst of that, again, it's like, okay, Jesus, like if this is your way of drawing me out mm. back to like live fully the Byzantine tradition, then okay. Like, it's kind of bizarre, but you know, we'll go with it. And uh, five days before, so I made a novena to St. Charbel nice. um, to take care of things for me. And five days before I was scheduled to make vows, on the eve of his feast day, uh, I got a call from the dicastery for Eastern churches that I had been given permission to profess vows. So I was like, nice. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's do it. I, I, I have I have had much closer calls even than that with change of ritual churches or permissions to celebrate marriage in a certain rite. I've literally gotten letters from the nuncio the day before the wedding <laughs> that I am able to celebrate a Byzantine wedding. Things like it's 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 crazy, and thank God. We have kind of lawyers that know people, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and fax machines are a thing, even though they don't do emails, they'll do like fax machines still. I'm like, all right. Um, a couple other clarifications. He mentioned um, The Way of a Pilgrim. Um, I would highly recommend that book for anybody who's curious about the Jesus prayer, where that comes from, and and one of the ways of using it. He also mentions the uh, Philokalia, which his mother has mentioned many times, and she reads from it, especially as a nun. It's basically a... Uh, 
compendium or a, a collection of the writings of the fathers, especially the desert fathers. And if you're going to read that, I highly recommend that you have some sort of direction along with that. Um, it can be uh, taken out of context. Um, it can be dangerous. Like there can be a a temptation towards spiritual pride and things like that, um, prelist and things if you try to just put all of that into action without any sort of guidance. Yeah, I would highly recommend you read it and I would highly recommend you read it along with uh, some sort of a spiritual guide or spiritual mentor, someone that knows you well and knows your tendencies and maybe could identify scrupulosity if it's there, pride if it's there. Um, I think sometimes we we human beings are looking for a guidebook. We're looking for do this and don't do this that is very, very explicit and and if we, it, sometimes people find the philokalia or they find anything, uh, ironically, except the scriptures. Um, the, the, <laughs> the, and it's just a tendency to say, to say, okay, if something says do this and don't do this, then that that is helpful to my spiritual life. Mm. But we were our last podcast was about this. Um, the relationship with Christ, of course, is what saves us. Mm-hmm. The union with Him. So, so as much as those we things, need the sacraments. <laughs> <laughs> we, exactly. We we definitely need the sacraments. Um, we 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 need, we need all these things. So so. The, but the relationship with Christ is what what saves us. So we need to, in a sense, see these things. To quote you yesterday, Mother, when we recorded the previous podcast, as helpful mm-hmm. to that end. Um, but the philokalia is just, it, it really is a beautiful, although honestly, honestly, I'm, I know this is sorry, but the look on mother's face, like I'm about to say heresy that there, there is, there, there, there's a tendency, <laughs> there's a tendency within the philokalia and within hesychasm in general. Mm. And it almost becomes our version of like what the Roman Catholic Church was in the in the Middle Ages after Thomas, where it's like the church started then. So many people in the Roman Catholic Church they want to go back to nothing before Trent. And again, Trent Trent is a it's a council, a ecumenical council, and, and it it it's simplified and brought a lot of things together. But but you they a lot of Roman Catholics don't go back any further than that, namely to the Desert Fathers, mm-hmm. namely to the fathers that I mean Thomas brought a lot of those fathers in in together in in some of his writings. But there's still other things mm-hmm. other than that, and we tend to do that with hesychasm. Mm-hmm. We tend to do that with All certain. Right, right, exactly. With certain ways of saying, well, this is just how it is. So I would even say, you know, every 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 Byzantine Catholic, every Catholic, every Christian should read the Philokalia, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But but there is a tendency to to say, just like reading the Prologue of Ulcrid, which is like our Synexari and our Story of the Saints, you can read the the Prologue of Ulcrid and get the impression that you cannot be a, a saint if you're married. You cannot be a saint if you have kids. Like, and you, you you need to leave your spouse to be holy. You 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 need to die a martyr to be holy. You know, don't do that. Don't yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Well, and the other the other issue with it, and part of the reason that I really think you need direction along with reading it, um, is because we have this tendency when we read something like the Philokalia, but even just the saints in general, to think, well, if this person's a saint and they said this, this must be the strictest truth. Yeah. And we tend to forget that they were also sinners and they also hadn't necessarily studied psychology mm-hmm. and they also didn't have um, yet St. John Paul II's theology of the body. And, you know, there's like things that the church has approved since then um, that bring about some clarification because they also were very influenced by the time in which they were living in. And, you know, it's similar to like when we read St. Paul, uh, his, his epistles is we always have to read those in the context of there were particular heresies that he was combating. And so if he's like swinging to an extreme in one direction, it's because he's trying to combat this particular heresy. And in the times of the Desert Fathers, in the times of the writings of the Philokalia um, across those centuries, they were also really having to, in extreme ways, fight out against particular heresies and particular struggles of sin in those particular times. And, please, brother. 
And the same is true. <clears throat> you were talking about the need for a guide, for a mentor in reading the Philokalia and engaging the texts of the fathers. The same is true interiorly, right? So like the texts of the Philokalia are this compilation of counsel given by these fathers or to these fathers by their fathers mm -hmm. to combat the heresies or spiritual interior heresies, tendencies of sin, passions that these particular men were fighting. Mm -hmm. Now there's a, there's obviously like a science of the fathers that has developed as we have so much writing and can study. There are lists of the passions that all of us deal with in some way, but also like our enemy is tricky and our human nature mm -hmm. is messy. And so there are particularities as well to like, my heresies, mm -hmm. quote unquote, where if I were to just like pick up Mother Natalia's journal and use it as a spiritual book, not only would that be really inappropriate, it would, <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't all be helpful yeah. because there are ways that she struggles with sin that I don't. There are ways that I struggle that she doesn't. And if I just start applying Father Michael's wisdom to her, like carte blanche, I might end up lost. Yes. Yeah, we had... Uh, at the monastery recently for our dinner reading, we have spiritual reading at the beginning of dinner and we had, um, this is not art of prayer. Oh, sure. um, <laughs> we were talking about that recently, okay. but um, we, there was a book and it was wisdom of some contemporary um, Orthodox monks or something like that. I don't remember. Anyways. And one of them, uh, it was kind of a compilation of some of his counsel and then it, Towards the end of his counsel, like one of the last things was he says, um, he says, don't ever publish these things that I'm saying to you, <laughs> which is very ironic. Um, whoops. Uh, but I was so appreciative to read that because the point that he was making and as he kind of um, expounded was that he's giving this counsel to particular people. Uh, and speaking into, you know, exactly what you're saying, Brother Simeon, like speaking into their particular wounds and their particular struggles. And um, we don't, you know, Climacus talks about this in the Ladder of Divine Ascent that um, like the the spiritual guide should be a doctor. The, the abbot of a monastery should be a doctor and doctors have to give different medicines for different illnesses. And um for some, you have to be heavy handed and some light handed and, um, which our listeners are very familiar with because father Michael and I have very different spiritual lives. Um, and, and both need very different medicine, which it's really funny because your spiritual father, father Michael is like much more similar to me. Right. <laughs> like, <yeah>. so <laughs> That's why I chose him. I was like, yeah. you, you, you need to draw me closer to that way of living because my disposition is the exact opposite. Yeah, and of that. you yeah. temper me in mm. the opposite direction. Yeah. And yeah. So, and so uh, I, I think it's, this is why I, I love the tendency even on like Byzantine and Orthodox social media when someone asks a question, all these people very predictably just write, ask your priest. You know, it's like, <laughs> this is not the place for this. It's just ask your priest. So I, th th there's something about that. Like ask someone who knows you, ask someone who can take all this information because when even, even though we are saying that St. Paul was speaking to a certain set of heresies and out of a certain culture, we still, every single line he wrote is still the word of God. And every single line he wrote is still for us. Um, but, but you have to say, when he says this line, because it is the ineffable, infallible word of God, mm -hmm. you have to say, how do I apply this in the spiritual meaning? Maybe not even in Paul's intention, mm -hmm. but in the spiritual meaning to this current day. And we cannot do that alone. We have to do that in, in conversation with the church and in the conversation where two or three are gathered. So every single line in the Bible ha has the spirits going to use that line today and every day, no matter what the, the, the very human intention of the human author was mm. is going to use that since there's another author to the divine author to speak into that so I think that, that it's to a lesser degree the philia, the, the philokalia can, can do that as well where you say How, I need someone to speak into this to say whereas this monk may be praying say a thousand Jesus prayers a day my spiritual director says according to your life we're going to lower that down to a hundred you know something like that so um, I, I, the, I was once, <clears throat> I was once given a thousand Jesus prayers as a penance, 
it takes me 15 minutes to do 100 Jesus prayers. That's a two and a half hour long penance. Um, and it felt like a really run of the mill confession. I'm just saying. It wasn't like I, anyway, yeah. That must be the pride then is why you, uh, <laughs> you, you thought it was just run of the mill. When it, <laughs> I'm, just kidding. I'm just kidding. But I, I, do, have a, I do have a story. Um, what happened when, when I first realized that, that Jesus works with all of us individually, I was probably like seven years old and we had our best friends and when I was seven were very wealthy and we weren't. And so I remember the, the way that they were able to live their life. I just remember saying, they can, they can do things we can't, you know, they can, they can risk things that we can't because they have the money to fix it. You know, mm-hmm. they, they may, we may be playing hard and go and, you know, knock down a door or punch a hole in the wall or something like that. And they're like, like, yes, we both get in trouble for doing that, but, but they can go and, and pat, like in my mind, this, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. it's pretty easy to patch a hole in the wall. I found out uh, multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like in my mind, that was like a huge deal. I like fixed the whole wall. So I was like, but I was like, well, their family can afford that. Mine can't. So I need to behave differently mm-hmm. than they do. And so as I got older, that, that became more and more obvious where I had to say, we all, have different giftedness. Mm. We all have different fears, different struggles, and we really do need to to say, "I'm going to behave in my spiritual life differently based upon the foundation that I have, the temperament that I have, the disposition that I have." And so, we really cannot compare ourselves exactly, you know, word for word, what is helpful to these the desert fathers. And I really do think that they would be abhorred. I think Thomas Aquinas would be abhorred by the fact that that. We basically put him up as the the only definer of doctrine, you know, in the, in the Catholic, especially the Roman Catholic Church. Like he would be abhorred by that. Like, like, you know, many Protestants will say, "Oh, oh my gosh, the Mother of God be abhorred." They wouldn't say that. Mary would be abhorred by the fact that you re- revere her. I'm like, no, you're wrong. I, I, she, like, this, this, it's very clear in my mind that mm-hmm. that we our our, our veneration, our, our reverence of her is good. Um, but like, I get it when they say that because I'm like, yes, there are saints who would say. Oh my gosh! Like, please find somebody else to talk to. Like, like to you know, you know read the, read other writings, find other things. I had my little place in the kingdom of God in the body of Christ. You need to find the other ones as well, especially for your your personality. And that is actually. I mean, I'm just thinking of Saint Francis of Assisi. Obviously, that's probably mm-hmm. anyway. <laughs> he that's his life. Like while he's alive, still mm-hmm. he, he has no intention of founding a religious order. He just wants to live the gospel. Yeah, be a poor man. And serve the Lord. So he does it. And then, you know, I don't know, it's within 15 years that he has thousands and thousands of followers. Everybody's looking to him. He's like, I don't know. And why are you, why do you think that I do? <laughs> like, I'm just trying to live the life. And it's, and then he pers- persevering in this that to, at the end of his life, one of his last counsels to the brothers is like, I have done what is mine. And I pray that you would, you would do what is yours. Yeah. This, this radical realization that like, Every man that's been called to live this life is called to live the gospel, called to union with Christ. But who am I to think that what that has looked like for me yeah. is what it needs to look like for everybody else that's put on this habit, for yeah. everybody else that's bought a philokalia, for everybody else that has a prayer rope, prayer rope around their wrist. Like God's designs are so much more manifold than that. Yeah. And, and, and the other side of that is these are highly respected sources of wisdom, knowledge, and holiness. So the St. Francis of Assisi, you know, the, his, his, his little way was helpful to so many people that he had thousands of people trying to imitate his life before he even died. I mean, this is, it, it, that, that's incredible to say, obviously falling in love with Lady Poverty as he did, you know, is, is helpful to a, a mass amount of people. And yet, there's things that, that you do imitate and then you let the spirit guide you to, to fill out the rest in ways that are, that are not like me. I, I have a, a very beautiful, humble friend who, uh, who got a tattoo and just recently two other people imitated that tattoo. And like, I, I, I know, I know that. I know the, what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I know that she was. I've only known was, these people for like 12 hours, <laughs> by the way. We would probably be horrified by the fact that people are, are getting her a tattoo, um, but also kind of flattered. And th- this is kind of the <laughs> the uh, the speaking of, of in, inside jokes. Um, 
but yeah, so it is those like the, when when we there is a certain wisdom, even with this podcast, we're saying you know we we love when people are inspired by it. But um, I think our main goal, Mother and I shared this after we recorded yesterday. Um, we're like, I think one of our main goals is actually to confuse people, like, and and that that's our job within the kingdom of God, so that they they're because I think confusion can be a really good thing, like thrown off balance. Um, having to work again, having to think again, to go deeper, and the the things that we thought were settled, mm. you know, if the church says it's settled, it's settled. But but the things that that that, that the church does not say are settled, that that we kind of have to debate and 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 fight with, and and things like that. Those those moments are some of the most beneficial to our holiness. Mm. One of the things I wanted to share with you, brother. Um, so when I was I went to University of Steubenville and. That's where I graduated in 2001, mm-hmm. and so we we had a lot of we had a lot of people, a lot of young men who were discerning the CFRs back then. So we would just literally go on a bus or a van out out to New York, and and to discernment weekends. And so there was one there was one discernment weekend. I think it was the only time I actually went out there and spent the entire weekend there, like to do a full um, discernment weekend. It was the house in uh, in Harlem. Mm-hmm. Which house are you in, brother? I live in the Bronx in the, in the South Bronx. Bronx. Okay, so. Um, it was a house in Harlem, and and all, it was so just so it was so me. I mean, I I loved. I remember walking around New York City, and it was like Mother was sharing earlier about if about being on an airplane and not wanting to disrupt the person next to her by <laughs> by putting the the tray away, you know, because he had his headphones in. Um, <laughs> it, it's it was like that with me with the poor who were asking for money. Like if I had money in my pocket and someone asked me for change. I just I, I didn't have a clear enough mind about when to give and when not to give when I was in college. I'm much more confident now, but I, I didn't have it clear in my mind. I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if I was walking around and I had a long gray habit on and a shaved head and a long beard, and that identified the fact that I have no money in my pocket. Mm-hmm. And so if someone approaches me, they need something else other than money. They need prayer. They need a, a, a good word. They need some encouragement. Um, they they just, they just I've met them before and we have a good conversation. I yearned for that. I yearned for the midnight runs where you were inconvenienced to actually go and bring food to the poor at midnight because that's when kind of people we were told are kind of settling back into their, into their tents and their outdoor sleeping areas. I yearned for the community, of course. I yearned for the fact that we would be eating and this, this someone knocking the door and like there's like seven little twelve year olds outside the door asking for one certain brother to come play basketball, you know. It was like all these things were just so beautiful to me, um, and yet after every single mass, I would sit there and I put my hoodie up, just because you guys put your hoods up. I put my hoodie up <laughs> and I sit there praying, and I just I had this draw towards the Byzantine liturgy mm-hmm. every single time, and I just said, well, so I would talk to our Lord and I said, you know, Lord, what do I do with this? And he said, and he said to me, you can have, I've said this before on the podcast, I think you can have everything they do um, as a Byzantine pastor, except community. Mm-hmm. And our Lord basically said that you're going to have to work for, that you're going to have to find. So when I was in Denver, I found community. I was a member of the Companions of Christ. But but this was, uh, and then years later, years later, um, the other brother, Simeon, um, now Matthew, um, he he, br- he brought uh, Father Benedict Rochelle to Denver and, and Father Benedict and I just hit it off right away. And so um, if, if our listeners want to see a very young Father Michael O'Loughlin, uh, just Google, what's it called, Thursday Night Live or Father Benedict Live, um, like from the early days on YouTube. And Father Benedict Rochelle, one of the founders of, of the CFRs, he had a show and, and I was on that. Um, and he I flew me out to New York. I could spend a week with him. Um, and then he, whenever he'd come to Denver, he'd stay with me in Denver in my house. And finally, one time I shared the story with him and he said, because he was his superior at the time, he said, you know, he said, if you had told me that, he said, I would have let you be formed completely Byzantine, like Byzantine seminary. Byzantine, I don't know if that's possible, but that's what he, he told me much later. I was already, I was already a priest. I thought, well, God had other plans, um, but it would have been, it would have been really beautiful. But that, that would, it would have been a, a great witness to, to the unique, take the Franciscan spirituality in a sense but live it out in a completely Byzantine way. That has not gone well in our church in the United States. It has not gone well at all. But so maybe it would have been a total failure, and that's why why, why God didn't do it. But but it would have been an interesting take something that's good and then talk to Jesus about making it your own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, another funny moment um, when Father Deacon Jonathan was talking to Mother Natalia and I about having you on was he said. Uh, he does. He does these 
um, Knights of Pustinia. <laughs> now, both of us saw you on a horse wearing armor <laughs> and, and, and and like with a big Pustinia written across your... your like we're both looking at each other so confused. <laughs> like he like, I'm, I'm thinking like Knights of the Holy Queen. I'm thinking of, you know, um, Militia Maculata. <laughs> it's actually in the rule of St. Francis, the, the rule that he wrote for the brothers that we are forbidden to ride horses. Oh, really? Seriously? Yeah. So sorry wow. to brister your Okay. <laughs> I do have my armor in the trunk of the car, but I can't ride a horse. Why didn't you wear it to the Hobbit party? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know there was a Hobbit party. We went over this. Can you share about what happened when you saw Sister Nupria? Okay, so I showed up at Christ the Bridegroom Monastery last night for eight days of silence, solitude, peace. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I come to the door. I, okay, I knew there was a birthday party. I had, I had been in touch with the sisters. Just so you know, brother, when you get here, we'll be in the middle of Mother Natalia's 33rd birthday party. That's totally fine. Um, I'm already scheduled to like do this podcast tomorrow, so I, I knew I wasn't starting Pistinia until after afternoon on Friday. Um, but so I show up at the door. I know there's a party going on. I ring the doorbell. One of the sisters comes around, and she has like a brooch on her veil. <laughs> And I, and I just started reading the Silmarillion again uh, like two weeks ago, right? And so, and we've been watching the extended edition Lord of the Rings movies in our shelter, um, so it's all kind of fresh in the mind. And I see this, and I'm like, that that looks like it's from Lord of the Rings. But like, like, do I ask? I mean, it's a nun. Do I insult her habit if I ask? <laughs> hey, I know you're like consecrated to Jesus, but you look like you're from Lord of the Rings right now. <laughs> So I didn't say anything, and then another another nun comes to the door, and she also has one on, and I'm like, I don't know what's going on, and then they're barefoot, and I'm like, I didn't know nuns could be barefoot. Uh, and then, the, did we tell you that this is a hobbit party? No, nobody told me that this was a hobbit party. I would have taken my shoes off earlier if I knew this was a hobbit party. Um, yeah, and so sure enough, I walk into Mother Natalia's 33rd birthday party, hobbit party. You even got a gift. And I got a gift. <laughs> Amazing from the main Hobbit. Yeah, I was. Uh, uh, we were all. We were all. Those of us who Hobbit did not guys. come dressed for a Hobbit party, including me. I came in my cassock, and somebody goes, "Oh, you're a ring wraith." And I was like, <laughs> um, "Okay, my long black cassock." Yeah, it's right. <laughs> <laughs> looks black like a ring wraith. But then I had the inspiration. I says, "Well, then my goal tonight is de horse a Hobbit, de horse an Amish," <laughs> 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 which I'm not going to do because we're in Amish territory, but. I got like half a laugh out of that, which I was appreciative. Um, so real quick, but um, it's N I G H T S, yeah, Pustinia, like, like day or night, <laughs> day or night. Yeah. So can you explain what that is and why it was probably so moving to Father Deacon Jonathan and those who witnessed it? Yeah, sure. So it kind of started to come about right after I had professed vows in the in the community, and uh, I was in conversation, I was doing some youth ministry stuff with a couple of Byzantine parishes in New Jersey with Father Tom Schubeck. And one day he was helping at our soup kitchen at the friary and just asked the question, I wonder what like a Byzantine Catholic underground would look like. So footnote, uh, Catholic underground is an apostolate of our community for many years now in New York City. Happens once a month. So it's basically an evening of Eucharistic adoration, starts with Vespers, and then a holy hour of adoration with praise and worship music led by the brothers. And then afterward, down in the church basement, to the underground part, there is um, like a concert, typically from some Catholic musician or artist, just an opportunity to kind of showcase Catholic culture, bring people together, and to adore the Lord. Um, and it's, it happens once a month in New York City, in Manhattan, and the church is typically packed. Hundreds of people, all generations are there. Um, and so I know some people, some Byzantine Catholics in the area who also go to this. And so Father Tom's, I wonder what it would look like to have a Byzantine Catholic underground. And I have also, I'd also wondered that. And so I was like, why don't we sit down and wonder about this together? And he's like, okay. So we sit down and I like to wonder. So we're just wondering. I thought we were wondering. Ideation. Yes. Yeah. But Father Tom is, is a, he does things. Oh, yeah. So we're wondering. Wondering is fun. Later on, I'm like, thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity to, to wonder about that. And then I get an email from Father Tom that's like a group email of like five other young adults. It's like, hey, when can we plan a, when can we have a planning meeting to, to do Byzantine Catholic Underground. And I'm like, so I like go to my superior. This is not, by the way, how you should ask for uh, permission <laughs> under obedience. Uh, Father, Father Stephen, like I, can I host a planning meeting for an event that I accidentally invented? <laughs> <laughs> like already. And thankfully he said yes. Um, 
I've this is what this has happened to me in my own community where I like accidentally started something and then had to go to the superior and be like, <laughs> so this happened. <laughs> what do I do now? Can it continue happening or no? <laughs> And so we started to have planning meetings, get together, and kind of put these things together. Um, yeah, and I guess the way that it really unfolded for me was very simply a desire for bringing, bringing people to personal encounter with Christ, the place where conversion happens, but clothed fully in the beauty of the East and the, in the beauty of the Byzantine tradition. And then obviously that there are accidentals or kind of external elements of Catholic underground that don't happen in the East, Eucharistic adoration being at the heart of things, praise and worship music, musical instruments in the church, some different elements that we wouldn't typically do. And so it just became this process of like, what does it look like to kind of approach the inner essence of these things with the different clothing on? Um, Okay, Eucharistic adoration as this completely unveiled face-to-face encounter with the Lord. Where, Where does this happen and how does this happen for us as Eastern Christians? And then like praise and worship music, what's happening in praise and worship music? It's often simple and repetitive and it's led. So as a simplicity, I can come to a night of worship and, and I can just bring myself. I don't have to prepare words. I don't have to prepare thoughts. I don't have to, there's no pressure to have like some fancy meditation. I just bring myself and allow the person at the microphone to lead me in prayer. Let their prayer become mine. And then the whole body of Christ is praying together. So there's this beautiful simplicity, repetition and and kind of humility in entering into the form of prayer. What does it look like to kind of enter into this as Byzantine Catholics, again, to like reclothe this same encounter that's happening in the light of the East? And so the first thing that kind of we place at the heart of it is iconography, that when I stand before the holy icon, I can approach the unveiled face of Christ in the same way. And so I just imagined the, the same event, but instead of a monstrance with the host at the, at the center on the altar, Typically for Catholic Underground, the lights are low. There's a spotlight on Jesus. You can't see anything but him. Okay, I'm going to turn all the lights off in the church. I'm going to put a spotlight on a giant icon in the middle of the church. What is the icon going to be? So I'm sitting with this in prayer. Um, and the thing that keeps coming keeps coming is the, the ruble of Trinity. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, and why? Because on the table in the icon is the bread of life, is the Holy Eucharist. And so the same way that when we go into Eucharistic, Eucharistic adoration, to adore the Holy Trinity present in the host, present in the bread of life. We sit before this icon and adore the Trinity, adore the host present at the heart of the Trinity. And so, okay, I need a giant icon of the Trinity. I remembered walking through the seminary at Seton Hall University and seeing this massive icon of the Trinity, handwritten in the corner by an elevator. So you stole it. And I didn't steal it. (laughs) I, I, I begged. I begged for oh, it. Nice. I'm a Franciscan. We I thought you were going to say you got a copy of it, but you got the actual one? No, so I went to Father Tom wow. who worked at the seminary, and I said, Father Tom, here's what's going to happen. Uh, <laughs> you're going to ask the rector if we can borrow that icon once a month for the evening to reverence it as it is due. I'm talking to the wrong side of the microphone. Okay. <laughs> um, and he said yes. And so we started to borrow this big icon of the Trinity, place it behind the tetrapod in the church, all the candles lit, lights in the church down, and then enter into prayer together. Uh, the anchor for the evening being the Jesus prayer, just like it would be in the, in the, the proper pristinia. Um, oh, and then that's the other, that's the last element behind kind of the genesis of the thing that I'll share is at some point it dawned on me that we shouldn't call it Byzantine Catholic underground. That doesn't have a ring to it. Um, and so I just told the team, what if we prayed about, uh, what to call these evenings that we're having. And, uh, then I went away on, on pristinia and I forgot to think about that. And, uh, (laughs) We were having, uh, the first one was like less than a month away. And so all these emails are coming through while I'm in Pistinia. They're like, hey, we need to make flyers. Like, what's the thing called? Does anybody have any ideas? Nobody's saying anything. And then finally, Father Tom just says, okay, nobody said anything. So I just named it Pistinia. We're going to go with that. But meanwhile, I'm, I'm in Pistinia, um, but it's, it's like a guided retreat. It's being preached um, on the Eucharist in part with the Eucharistic revival. And at some point, the there was a conference on adoration and the priest started with all of these biblical like typology for Eucharistic adoration. And I was sitting there like, this is all typology for solitude, for pastinia, uh, for aloneness with God. Uh, and so I was like, Oh, that's it. Like it's, 
it's called Pustinia. And then I got home from the retreat and I saw Father Tom's email. He was like, I just named it this because, you know, we ran out of time. And I was like, no, you named it that by divine inspiration. This is totally what it's supposed to be called. Um, so Pustinia means yeah. desert in Russian. And, uh, and just the, how, how is this an expression that I think of, of desert? Because there's, there's, there's other, like right now we're in a Pustinia. Right, that, that that is at Christ the Bridegroom, a little a little mini desert, yeah. and and how how is this like that experience? I think the the I come back, I come back always to Saint Paul, Second Corinthians, and he's commenting on and kind of like interpreting spiritually for us the relationship of Moses and God. Right, that like Moses looked upon God and he veiled his face mm. uh, as it was shining, but we with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are changed from glory into glory. By the Spirit, so this unveiled face, unveiled beholding of the Lord that we're invited to, very concretely in Eucharistic adoration, but in the Pustinia, the same thing occurs, right? Because Moses, where does he look upon God most directly? In the burning bush, in the desert, mm. on Sinai, in the desert. This place of combat, yes. This place of intimacy. This place where all falls away, and I am consumed in relationship with God and God alone. It is me and him. And so this happens for us very concretely, the, the beholding in Eucharistic adoration, but the invitation in the Pustinia, the, the desert, um, like Father said, we're in a Pustinia now. Um, we take time of Pustinia to be alone with the Lord. Um, but in this particular Pustinia where we are right now, there there is not a host reserved. There's no tabernacle. Mm-hmm. There's no Eucharistic adoration. But what there is, right, is that we with unveiled faces behold the glory of the Lord dwelling within us. Mm. And so the same way that I'm invited to behold Christ in the host in adoration, I'm invited to behold Christ dwelling in the heart of man, dwelling in my own soul. And the Pustinia is the place where all distractions from that fall away. The distractions of the world, the noises, the sounds, unless Mother Natalia is recording things in the basement, (laughs) fall away. (laughs) so that I can behold the glory of the Lord with unveiled face dwelling within myself. Mm. And the Pistinia is this place, just like Eucharistic adoration, where everything else falls away. It's, it's very interesting. I, that gives me a lot to meditate upon because right now I believe in our, in our Byzantine Catholic churches, we are beginning to reappreciate the role, the good role of veiling things. So fuller iconostases, um, even um, I, I only learned this past year the tradition we shared in, in one of our podcasts on Holy Week of the priest actually veiling his head when he walks around with the Eucharist for the presanctified mm. and the people not looking at it, but rather being prostrate on the ground and not looking at the Eucharist as it comes by. And the, there's such a beautiful ancient Byzantine tradition about the, in a sense, our senses can prevent can prevent the full understanding of what this is. And so we, in a sense, hide the the physical sense of sight from looking at the Eucharist in order to actually perceive it more clearly and more in, an, in a sense in an unveiled way. This is just a mystery. And it's, it's a way of encountering and, 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 and living within that mystery. But we, of course, as Christians... God became man. God, God, there, there was a the veil was removed, and and now God dwells in our hearts, as you said. Um, one of the also you mentioned, you know that 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 we in a sense become the tabernacle in a way in our in the Pustinia. We we find God inside of ourselves, which is just a beautiful idea, and we do that in the desert. By the way, by desert. You don't need to like come out the Joshua tree. I mean, I'd love if you did come out the Joshua tree. I'll I'll give you a tour. Um, but like, you you don't need to actually go to the desert. The desert just means a place where, in a sense, the luxuries and the temptations are gone. Mm-hmm. So you 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 go out to a place where all the the normal course of life is is not happening. So one thing I've I've did uh, just this happened yesterday in prayer. I decided that I am going to begin my day in the office with zero notifications. So I, that so it happens with my brain. If I open my phone to do a very specific task or open my computer to a very specific task, I have to sort through all the notifications before I get to that task. It's horrible. Mm-hmm. And therefore, I don't get to the task, right? I, I'm dealing with all these other things. I've, I've decided, you know what? I'm going to plan my day in a physical planner, in a paper planner, and not even look at my phone until until I have the whole day planned out 
And then I will look at my phone and let notifications start creeping in. Um, because I think that's what the desert is in a sense. When we go on Pustinia, what we're is providing ourselves with two or three days, or in your case, what, eight days, brother, all, which is great, um, with, with a separation from the normal course of life. And in, in, in that silence of the desert, in the lack of um, distraction in the desert, in the, the lack of luxury and oh, with the lack of temptation, Although there's there's a lot of temptation when we find that alone time, of course, when we're alone with ourselves, but the, the desert becomes this this very beautiful separation from the world um, in that way. My favorite scripture, which I'm sure I've talked about this before uh, on the podcast, probably probably in the first episode that we talked about Pustinia. Uh, my favorite scripture about this time in the desert pertaining to Pustinia is the second chapter of Hosea. Um, because it's, it's about Israel being unfaithful and how the Lord responds to that infidelity. So the first part of the chapter is about how he's going to, to strip everything away. Um, and there's this beauty of like, so I'll just read starting um, chapter two of Hosea, starting with verse um, five, like halfway through verse five. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, I will hedge up her way with thorns and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better with me then than now. And then um, it goes on to say basically how um, the Lord will expose Israel's infidelity. Uh, But then we get to verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her, which the word for wilderness is the same Mm. word that we translate into desert. Um, I will allure her and bring her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. And I just, I love this concept um, when thinking of Pustinia, when thinking of the time in the desert, because it can feel when all of those things are being stripped away and we're not getting the things we want, when we're not getting the consolation that we want, um, it can feel like punishment and it can feel um, just super painful, um, that stripping away. But it's very clear in this passage that the Lord does this as gift to remind us that he's the one that we need. And he brings us into the wilderness, into the desert in order to speak tenderly to us, not to... um, not to leave us alone and barren, but to bring us to encounter with him, which is fruitful. Um, And so that like, as those fruits grow in the desert, we know that the only nourishment those fruits have had is him, the living water. And um, yeah, so I just, and, and just, I've talked about this before as well, but just the humility of the Lord, um, that he still so deeply desires us and wants us to come back to him um, when we've gone so far astray and we've chased after false lovers and all of these things. Um, and he just like, yeah, he's he's <laughs> humble enough to to desire us even when we make him our last choice. And when it's like, well, there's nothing else. I've tried everything else. You're the only one here. Um, yeah. You reminded me of two things. I love that passage as well. And particularly also the, yeah, I will speak tenderly to her because I think we enter into the Pustinia and we have this idea based on like a caricature of the desert fathers. That is that I now need to like, like I can't enjoy, I, I just have to like eat like dirt and mm-hmm. sleep, you know, on, I don't know, spikes and pray all night. And I guess I can't sleep and pray all night. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I think we form, we can form this caricature of the fathers that then I like project onto my Pistinian experience and I forget that God is tender. And the reality of this life of the fathers is that, yes, they were, they were men in the desert who, there were women in the desert, the desert mothers as well, who did violence 
to the life of sin, to the reign of sin in, in their broken human nature, but in so doing, experience the tender voice of God such that they became tender themselves. So like if tenderness isn't a fruit of my time in Pustinia, I might need to revisit my motivations, my prayer time, how it is, where and when or why I'm, I'm going into Pustinia. Um, I, I love haiku. This is, seems random, but I'm going to, I love <laughs> haikus. They force me to like take my confusing brain uh, with like all of the thoughts that can like run around in times of prayer and meditation and just like condense it into this is how much time you have. Like this is the amount of syllables you have mm-hmm. to express what God is doing. And often like my, my, when I meet with my spiritual father, it'll begin with me reading whatever was the most recent haiku mm-hmm. came up in, pr- in prayer um, and then kind of like unfolding that word. Um, and you reminded me of one that I often read to myself when I come back into times of Pustinia. Um, and so that it, it's in, it's committed to memory at this point. I think I wrote it at the end of my first eight day Pustinia experience as a friar. Um, and so I hate sharing things that I wrote or created, but I'm going to do it now. Um, yeah. So anyway, this is it. Oh, tender violence make of this wilderness heart a bridal chamber. Mm. It's like, this is what God is doing in the Pustinia. And what I am doing in the Pustinia is secondary to that. Mm. Yes. I want to focus on the scriptures. I want to spend time in prayer. I want to, maybe I'll fast a little bit to kind of put away, purify the senses, the worldly allurements, but always that what I am doing is secondary to what God is doing, which is making streams in the desert Making the fruit, making fruitful the land of waste, making the wilderness heart a bridal chamber, mm-hmm. wherein He will come to dwell with me. This is the, this is the heart and soul of what God is doing in the Pustinia. Amen. I was going to ask you, brother, for a final word, and I think that was beautiful. And that that's it. So I appreciate that. Um, all right. It's been great having you. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your holiness. Thank you for your words. Um, and your vocation and all that you're doing, may you persevere. You're in, you're three years in right now into what's the typical number for formation? Uh, the minimum is four years in temporary vows before petition for, for perpetual for life vows. So okay. the next coming year, which was going to be the prayer intention I was going to ask, I'll nice. be preparing to, to petition for perpetual vows in the community. So um, yeah, minimum of four. All right. Excellent. Well, okay. We'll get to prayer intentions in a moment. Um Thank you all for listening and uh, for for your uh, prayers for us as well. Um, if you are encouraged by anything you heard today, please do share this um, with those you think would grow from it, um, just for the sake of the word of God and the, and the building up of the kingdom. Um, we get we get nothing from this podcast except when you email us and tell us how much you love us. But um, <laughs> we do, we don't make any money or like that up. So so we can hopefully say that that we want this this to spread for the glory of God and actually mean it. Um, we are on to that end. We are on social media, Facebook and Instagram. I'm on Twitter at Potter Michael O. Um, I'm coming upon four thousand followers on Twitter as I noticed the other day, which is exciting in a very human way. Um, <laughs> But, uh, Are you gonna have a party? Yeah, oh, when you reach I 4, hope not. I, 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 I'm resisting the temptation to 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 say on the podcast. I have this podcast that I do sometimes, and I'm like, I'm really resisting the temptation to even share that on the podcast. Um, but the uh, <laughs> she's not even she usually rolls her eyes. She's not even doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm at, at Potter Michael O. Um, we are on uh, YouTube as well, audio only at this point. We have a nonprofit called Fotina, P H O T I N A, named after the Samaritan woman at the well, and uh, she uh, it has multiple goods. If you support us financially, one hundred percent of the money goes to these goals, but we have twenty percent goes to the poor, the hungry, the thirsty, the strangers, naked, ill, and imprisoned in creative ways. Ten uh, percent goes to the church, which is our tithe. The ten percent goes to other projects and programs are doing something similar to ours, especially in the way of evangelization. And then the rest goes to our own evangelization efforts um, to build up the kingdom of God. 
Um, you can support us through Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You can find us at What God Is Not on there, and you can support us monthly, and there are various benefits uh, to that, um, starting with stickers and ending with a visit, and everything in between there, including Zoom meetings and the opportunity to actually come on and listen behind the scenes while we record live and things like that. Um, so thank you for your support. For the many of you who do support us, we're going to get back to shout outs in a bit. Um, but we don't, we're, Mother and I are together now, as you may have guessed. And so we don't have that list in front of us right now. Uh, we, you can also go to fotina.org, which is our, uh, nonprofit website. And you can donate there as well. And you'll be guided on how to do that. We also have a locker at Chesterton Cigar Lounge in Steubenville, Ohio, um, that one of our listeners supports. So if you want to go have a, a time in the lounge and a free cigar or two on us, um, email us at our at what God is not podcast at gmail.com and we'll make sure that we get you into that. We just need to call them ahead of time, let them know you're coming. Um, we also have a website, whatgodisnot.com. And so, uh, yes, thank you for for supporting us and thank you for listening. And we'll go right into prayer intentions. Um, I These two men. <laughs> These two men. The woman named Bill, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm not going to pray for the awkwards in my life. Um, I'm going to pray for... Um, you know, we we are we are still waiting on a bishop um, in my eparchy of Phoenix, and it's just it's getting it's getting a bit ridiculous. Um, not in God's mind because He has a plan. It's getting ridiculous in, in our sinful minds, as many my, me and my, many of my brother priests. So, if you will pray for our current bishops, um, Metropolitan William, Bishop Kurt, and Bishop Ro- uh, Robert, um, for the other eparchies, and pray that we have one for our eparchy too. Um, I know God's working. I know it's all going to work out well, but um, we we need a, a good, strong, courageous, prudent leader to guide our eparchy. I'll just ask for that in prayer. Um, and prayerful. A prayerful bishop. Amen. Uh, I will ask for prayers for Madison because I love her a lot, and she was just here visiting. She primarily threw the Hobbit party, um, and she's been gone for um, <laughs> about almost exactly twelve hours, and my heart is breaking. So pray for Madison Amen. and for my poor heart. Ask for prayers for, yeah, I mean, selfishly, myself in the next year. I guess it's not selfish because pray for uh, preparation for vows, which is for God, so it's not selfish. Mm-hmm. Um, and also for uh, the men at St. Anthony's Shelter, our brothers in the Bronx run a, a homeless shelter, and so we have 26 men who live there. And Just ask your prayers. I won't name them all, um, but ask your prayers for them. And for Landon Joseph, which is my nephew who was born a month ago, uh, my twin sister's first baby. So pray for her family. Awesome. All right. Love you, mother. Very nice to meet you, brother. Love you too. Love Um, you both. Yes. Amen. Thank you for your ministry. And and now you can actually, thank you for giving us this time of your pustinia when (laughs) when you're supposed to be getting away from all of this and, uh, and we selfishly brought you in, but... I think people will will learn a lot and be very inspired by by all that you said, and I really appreciate that. Absolutely, Father Michael, can you give us a blessing? Absolutely, may Lord bless you and keep you, cause His face to shine upon you, have mercy on you. May our Lord allow you to give the gift of Pustinia to those whom you love, and to receive from them also that gift. Uh, may you see those who in your life are are busy and distracted, and may you. Uh, through your own courage and through your own self-giftedness, um, take upon their responsibilities if that's possible and allow them to have time of pustinia, whatever that may mean, according to your life and your guidance. May you find Christ dwelling in your own heart. May you um, find the unveiled exposure to the Son of God um, and realize that you are a tabernacle bearing within you and carrying around with you to others in ministry, but also in contemplation. Um, the incarnate word who desires nothing more than union with you and that to happen over the course of eternity. 
May our Lord allow you to be truly earthen vessels carrying this light with you and may others find Christ through your ministry. And may you also build up those around you that their gifts may also shine in this one body of Christ, this one kingdom of God that we all participate in as best we can. May our Lord allow you to be truly penitential for anything keeping you from complete union with him and joyful in the gifts he's given you and even joyful in that process of penance. May the Lord give you everything you need, even the salvation of your soul. May he bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.